great. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our fourth session of the Guarini School of Business Summer Speaker Series. Today, we are featuring one of our new adjunct professors, Paul Dalalibi, who is truly an expert in the field of esports and the business side of competitive video gaming. In early 2019, St. Peter's University was one of the first colleges in the nation to launch a business major specialization in esports. And this past spring, we added a minor in esports business that incorporates courses from the liberal arts and philosophy, sociology, and communication, providing students with a strong understanding of both the business side of esports as well as the broader societal issues surrounding gaming, gaming and widespread use of technology. St. Peter's also has a competitive esports team with 60 plus students that play eight different games, and we've made it to the conference championships. Uh, two years in a row. We actively recruit high school students to play on our esports team, and we award thousands of dollars in scholarships each year to talented players. I believe Coach Bannon will be joining us on the call today as well. So I'm so grateful to Paul Dowalibi, who reached out to me a year and a half ago after seeing our press release about our new esports program. At, in, in that time, he has helped us to identify new pathways for student internships in this field, including hiring one of our senior students at his company. We are so pleased to have him as an adjunct professor this fall, teaching esports branding and marketing. I think it would be fair to say that Paul is a serial entrepreneur with a passion for finance and investing, as well as esports. After launching his career early on at IBM Canada, he founded and invested in a series of startups with his two most recent ventures focused specifically on esports. He and his business partner have a wonderful weekly esports podcast, which you can easily sign up for. He also advises major global brands on how they can align their branding and marketing strategies to leverage the rapidly evolving video gaming market. Today's presentation is called The Games Must Go On. Amid pandemic, esports expands and reshapes the future of fun. It is one competitive sport that has not been interrupted by the global pandemic, and many new gamers are emerging while quarantines are in place. I would like to pass it over to Paul Dalalibi to share his expertise on this exciting field of sports and entertainment. And I would ask if everybody can please keep your mics on mute until uh, the question and answer portion of the event. So thank you so much, Paul. I'm handing it over to you. Thank you so much, Mary Kate. Um, <laughs> if if anyone had told, you know, the ten year old gamer in me, you know, 25 years ago that I was going to be talking to universities and teaching at universities about gaming, um, I probably would have said you're crazy. That this <laughs> this future uh, was never going to happen. But it's here, and uh, you know, I'm extremely passionate about gaming, obviously, and esports. And I think a lot of people spend a lot of time talking about the future of work. And, and I like to talk about gaming as the future of fun. And, and the title I think is very apropos. The pandemic has really accelerated sort of how we think about the future of fun. So um, who am I? Mary Kate covered most of it. Not gonna spend a lot of time here. Uh, I'm the CEO of something called Holodeck Ventures. Basically we're a holding company and incubator of products and services for the gaming industry. So we create companies uh, that are building technology for the industry. Uh, I'm also co-host of the Business of Esports podcast. Uh, I encourage anyone who's interested in esports, uh, this is a shameless plug. If you're interested in the intersection of business and gaming, this is what we cover every week. We do a weekly podcast. We do a weekly live stream. I do a weekly video every week that's like three minutes about everything you need to know, like a condensed version. Uh, you can find it at thebusinessofesports.com on my LinkedIn uh, and, and some other places, obviously, anywhere you get your podcast. Um, I'm also the founder and CEO of something called Conquest. As Mary-Kate mentioned, uh, one, of my, one of my missions in life is getting more brands, more business, looking at gamers in the gaming world and figuring out how they can benefit from this because it's truly, in my mind, a, an untapped opportunity for them. So. That's what I do day to day. Um, but like I said, have been a, a gamer as long as I can remember. So, um, you know, this, this I'll ask rhetorically because everyone's on mute, but what was the most watched sporting event in 2019? 
Um, and I usually put this question to people. And most of the time, the guesses I guess I get are like the Super Bowl. Super Bowl is everyone's typical guess. Um, the hint at the bottom is it was not the Super Bowl. In 2019, the most watched sporting event was actually the League of Legends World Championships, which is a video game. And uh, by a pretty fair margin. So globally, it had a considerably larger audience than the Super Bowl. I mean, this should make you take pause. If it doesn't, um, you know, I don't think uh, you realize the gravity of that, but something's happening, right? That means a change is happening in society. And coronavirus has accelerated that change. It's, I wouldn't say it, it's changed the, the direction we're going, but it's accelerating the direction we're going. And, and all you had to do was look at the news. And this is news from like March or April, where literally every headline was gaming is exploding because people have nothing else to do while they're quarantined at home. And, and it's the one thing you could do while you were quarantined at home. And so literally every, every headline was esports is mainstream now. Gaming's mainstream now. We need to get into esports. Brands need to get into esports. Like literally everything was saying this is the next big gold mine. Um, the reality, though, is that this revolution was already underway. Like, coronavirus brought it potentially into the mainstream. But my simple thesis is gaming is not only the future of fun, but it's the future of media, it's the future of entertainment, it's the future of sports. Literally, the it will impact and disrupt dozens of other industries, travel, education, you name it. The way we deliver all this kind of content um, is going to fundamentally be changed by gaming. You know, I, I like to say the gamers shall inherit the earth. Um, <laughs> um, but, but gaming has gone mainstream. And for most people, it's relatively new, right? You, you probably were exposed to gaming recently. Maybe you saw Ninja on Ellen. Maybe you saw Booga, who won uh, the Fortnite World Cup on The Tonight Show. Maybe you saw Ninja on The Tonight Show. Or maybe it's just your kids who play Fortnite or Rocket League, or maybe you're a gamer yourself. But the reality is gaming has gone, has gone mainstream. That's just the tip of the iceberg, though. That, like this, this mainstream news only, only tells 5% of the story. There's a revolution that is coming. And, and let me try and explain what that revolution looks like. I, and I mentioned this before, multiple multi-billion dollar industries are going to be disrupted or completely replaced in the next 20 years. And it's gaming that's going to bring about that disruption. How? Why? Right? What's the underlying cause of this revolution? The, the first piece of the, the revolution is being caused by an attention shift. Okay? What's happening is if you ask your average 10-year-old if they would rather play Fortnite or play soccer, the large majority, and, and most of the numbers back this up, the large majority are gonna choose Fortnite than soccer. And, and millennials now are spending more on video games than traditional TV. They're spending more time gaming than on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. Like it's literally replacing social media, traditional entertainment, traditional sports, in terms of attention and time spent. There's also a technology shift that's happening um, in this like increasingly, again, a lot of people talk about the future of work in an increasingly AI automation driven world. Now we have a lot more time. The reality is we're much more productive as a society. How much time we have for recreation is increasing and technology is getting to the point where we can create virtual worlds that are indistinguishable from the real world. Um, what, what scientists call the uncanny valley for Star Trek fans, you might have seen something called the ho like holodex in Star Trek. The idea that technology at some point in the future, and I would argue it's maybe 20 years away, at some point in the future is going to create the ability to create virtual worlds that the human brain cannot distinguish from the real world. Well, you will walk into a room and be anywhere doing anything you want. When you think about that, the impact that has, again, what happens to the travel industry? What happens to how we do education, right? Imagine being able to take your class to the pyramids instead of just teaching them about it. Um, what happens to 
how you deliver like music, like traditional entertainment, music, movies. Imagine going to a concert with 10 million other people instead of 10,000 or watching a football game and everyone can be on the 50 yard line. No one has to be in, in the bleachers, right? The ability to deliver even what we consider traditional entertainment will be changed by this. And so fundamentally, all these industries get disrupted by gaming. So what's esports? Because that, that's the word I think people hear the most. And how is it different from gaming? And you'll notice I use them somewhat interchangeably. Um, the most common definition you'll hear for esports is, it's obviously short for electronic sports, and it's the business of professionals playing video games competitively in front of a viewing audience. In my mind, that's too narrow of a definition, right? It's, it's, esports is so much bigger than that. And the, the argument I use is that if someone's doing laps in a pool, we would say they're playing a sport, they're doing a sport. Or if a person is shooting basketball solo in their driveway, we would still say they're playing a sport. Like saying it's just pros playing on a stage and people watching them is too narrow of a definition. So in my mind, esports and gaming are kind of interchangeable in terms of definitions. This is kind of a view of the ecosystem, because um, I think for a lot of people, it's a bit of a mystery in terms of what's happening and who are the players. Um, let me focus on the first sort of three rings uh, on the right here, the, the, concentric, the large concentric rings. You have at the core here, the hardcore professional gamers, right? These are Esports athletes, they're competing in organized leagues for prize money. Outside of that, you have a larger layer of amateur competitive gamers. These are gamers competing at a high level. They're maybe streaming their gameplay, uh, but, but they're not necessarily paid to be doing it. And, and then you have all gamers, kind of that bigger circle where maybe you're not playing competitively, maybe you know, you're not that good, it doesn't matter, you're, you're still in that all gaming category. The circles around that, the teams, channels, events, publishers, and leagues, um, those are the pieces that touch gamers. So the teams are group of gamers, like groups of players, the channels are things like Twitch or YouTube where you can find gaming related content. Uh, the events, are things like the League of Legends World Championship. These are competitions that are streamed live or that take place live. Um, you have leagues like Overwatch League or Call of Duty League, just like you would have the NFL or the uh, you know, uh, NHL. And then you have the publishers, which are the companies that make the games, Activision Blizzard, EA, et cetera. Um, some of the numbers here that are interesting, um, in terms of how gaming is growing and, and the kind of place it takes in society. Um, again, I, and I said this before, and I'll emphasize it, more people today watch video games than Netflix, HBO, ESPN, and Hulu combined. If you look at the hours spent watching all those platforms and you add them all up, there's more hours watched for video games than all of them combined. Um, more people are playing more too. So it's not just watching more, it's playing more. There's two and a half billion gamers globally. Two out of three Americans consider themselves gamers. That could be gaming on a mobile phone, on a PC, on a console. Um, and video gaming is now more engaging than any other social media outlet. So on average, people like a gamer spends 51 minutes a day playing. Twitch, um, if, you, if you haven't heard of it, it's a live streaming platform. It's like you can go there and watch people playing games or just chatting or doing art or essentially streaming themselves and their lives and, and them playing. Um, Twitch had 10 billion hours watched in 2019. Two million people streamed their lives on Twitch. Um, it gets 15 million unique daily visitors. And, and when people get on Twitch, they spend on average about 100 minutes per session spectating. Um, Twitch, uh, for, for those who don't know, um, actually is, is owned by Amazon. So this is Amazon's big play in the gaming world. 
Um, YouTube dominates gaming VOD, which is video on demand though. So where Twitch is the live stream kind of champion, YouTube is the video on demand. In other words, the previously recorded. So you watch something that someone recorded and then uploaded. Um, in YouTube gaming's case, they had 50 billion hours watched of gaming videos in 2018 and 200 million users log in daily to watch gaming content on YouTube. It's huge numbers, not like massive numbers. The beauty of it is gamers have money to spend as a market. 43% um, of esports enthusiasts have a household income of 75K per year or higher, and almost a third have an income of 90K or higher. And the average spend per gamer is growing double digits year over year, 60% uh, as of this year. The audience is also large. Uh, I talked about two and a half billion gamers worldwide, but there's almost half a billion esports viewers. So people who don't just play, but who watch other people playing. Uh, and 65% of fans are between the ages of 18 to 34 with remarkably, and this surprises most people because they think it's very male dominated, uh, almost 40% being women. So what are some of the, the myths around gaming? I, I like to bust some of the myths and it makes for usually good discussion after. Um, the first one you hear all the time is gamers are just a small group of antisocial teenagers playing in their mom's basement. Um, again, uh, <laughs> the, the rebuttal to that is, well, this is obviously a myth. The rebuttal is they comprise a third of the world's population. They're young, they have disposable income and they represent one of the most highly connected digital first demographics. So totally untrue, this is a myth. Um, myth number two, video games are just for kids. Most people prefer to watch real, and I put that in quotation, sports. Um, Esports tournaments have now outstripped all traditional sports events, both in terms of viewership and prize pool. So it's not just more people watching, there's more money available. Um, like I mentioned right up front, League of Legends Championship had a larger audience than the Super Bowl, the World Series, the Stanley Cup, and the NBA Finals. And Buga, the winner of the Fortnite World Cup, who I had on that slide previously, he won more money in that tournament than Tiger Woods won at the Masters. He's 16 years old, he won like $4 million. Um, Myth number three, only endemic gamer brands should care about gamers and esports. And when I say endemic, this is usually, it's a term that's used to refer to brands that are game specific, like they make headsets or they make keyboards or they make controllers. Like some people think only those brands should care about gamers and esports. The reality is all, like my view from a business perspective is all brands should care about it. Um, the spending is going up, as I mentioned. And some of the most successful partnerships have been with non-endemic brands. And I, I recommend anyone who's interested to look up what Louis Vuitton did with League of Legends, where they had Louis Vuitton skins in the game. They made a Louis Vuitton trophy case for the winner. Uh, it was a really great integration of their brand into gaming um, and was received tremendously well. So perfect example of a brand not endemic to gaming uh, that has done very well there. Uh, myth number four, there are no female gamers. It's a male audience only. Again, 45% of U.S. gamers are women. Uh, the average female gamer is 36 years old. And the most active group among women makes up about 13% of the global gaming community. So totally, totally a myth. It's a misconception. In summary, um, video game and esports, you know, I, I, I probably have said this a million times, but it's the fastest growing form of entertainment on the planet. We're talking about a, a, a business, an industry, a market that has already surpassed most traditional media, both in terms of dollars and audience. Gamers are untapped in terms of a demographic and they're young, global, and digital first. So the, here's the window of opportunity in my mind and, and kind of the message for anyone interested in this from a St. Peter's perspective. If you're a student, in my mind, you have to be considering an esports education because gaming, the gaming phenomenon is the single largest opportunity 
you can take advantage of in this decade. Like we're talking about the next Instagrams, the next Facebooks, the next TikToks are all going to come out of that gaming world. And so anyone who wants to be on the cutting edge, to me, this is, this is where you need to be from a business perspective. So, you know, in my mind, you need to act now. What are the options and next steps? Uh, I like to say, don't go alone. <laughs> Education's critical here. And when I talk to brands about this, I say, I'm your partner. You know, I can help you get there. In this case, St. Peter's is your partner. The webinar here was the first step. But in my mind, there's a ton more educational opportunities. There's some of these courses St. Peter's is offering, one of which I'm teaching. Um, but although the gaming opportunity is massive, I think the most interesting part about an education in esports is you get a skill set that is massively transferable to other areas, right? We're talking about an industry that is all about marketing, digital marketing, understanding that digital world and the components and how they play together. Like there's no reason you couldn't take that skill set and go work for a social media company or some other tech company. Like there are the, the skill set is incredibly transferable because we're talking about an industry that's at the cutting edge of entertainment, technology, and, and digital, call it. Um, and, and to me, that's, that's the bonus. That's what you get that I don't think you can get in any other area today. Having said that, um, you know, if there's interest, uh, Mary Kate's the one to reach out to and, and here's her email address. Um, but happy to take any questions, happy to dive further into anything that was in this presentation. I know I flew through that because I wanted to make enough time for more discussion and more interactivity here than just me talking, uh, but happy to sort of address anything that was in here or anything of interest related to gaming. Thank you so much, Paul. That was awesome. Um, I particularly like your myth number one because I, I was definitely under the impression that uh, my kids playing video games was really just sort of wasting time. And over the past 18 months, as we implemented our new program at St. Peter's, I've really learned so much about gaming. There are so many young people that are doing really interesting uh, businesses and entrepreneurial activities in the field. I'm also amazed I meet a lot of parents of high school students who are very educated in esports and gaming. So I think one of the challenges for us at St. Peter's right now is to communicate effectively with families, not only the students or the potential students, but also their parents about what are the opportunities um, in the field of esports. Paul, maybe you can stop sharing your screen so we can uh, see. Yeah, sorry. No problem. Thank you. Um, so Kevin, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I think you might've had a question sort of maybe comparing how esports and uh, more traditional sports have, have fared during this pandemic and sort of the outlook, uh, bless you, going forward. Yeah, thanks, Mary-Kate. And uh, Paul, it was an excellent uh, presentation. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm concerned that, uh, well, first of all, I, I just retired from teaching and I taught uh, teenagers. I taught math classes at the uh, high school level. And um, I could see that some students had an aversion to the traditional courses that they were studying. And uh, very often they would uh, remark, well, I'm just going to be a gamer. And uh, that's why I don't really care about these other academic pursuits. So while I recognize the, uh, the market and, and the tremendous potential for esports and gaming, um, I'm concerned somewhat that some percentage of students use it as an excuse uh, not to pursue their best in academic studies. I mean, it's a great, it's a great point and a great question, Kevin. The, the, you know, my, my answer to that is the reality is sports had the same problem and still has the same problem, right? Like you get kids who, who think they're going to be great basketball players and, you know, don't really care about academics, don't really care about studying because they think they're going to go to the NBA and Paul, make millions Paul, of Paul, I think we, we lost your sound for a minute, or maybe that was just me. Can, um, can you hear? 
I, yeah, we can. I, I heard you continuously. All right, that's just my internet connection, sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, sports had a similar problem. I think it's a relative, it's a small enough minority that, that it can be managed by the teachers and the people there, right? The, the bigger question is, do the benefits outweigh those, you know, those downsides? And I think everyone I've talked to, and we had a guest on the podcast two or three weeks ago, um, whose company, Mission Control, basically, uh, or sorry, Generation Esports organizes leagues for middle schools and high schools, primarily some colleges. And what they're finding and the feedback from, from the academics, from the, the, univer- from the, the schools is the engagement from the students is higher in classes. Their attendance is better in classes because the, it captures kids who may otherwise not have had any interest in going to school. And now all of a sudden they have some reason to go, right? And I think when you see benefits like that, it probably outweighs the two or three who think, I don't need to worry about school because I'm going to go be a professional gamer. I think that has, to be, that has to be managed by the teachers, right? Like, I don't know, or the parents, essentially. Um, because it's just as unlikely of a career path as going and being a pro basketball player. Like, yeah. the chances of making it big sure. are about the same. I don't know if that answered your question, Kevin, but it's a, you're, it's a good point and it's a similar problem. It's not one that I don't think. Yeah, I mean, especially uh, in your presentation, you brought up that uh, more 10 year olds would rather play Fortnite than go out and play, kick a soccer ball. And um, that, that element is growing and, and into younger and younger ages. So the mindset really gets formulated at a very, very young age when they're, when they're vulnerable to making perhaps wrong choices. And if they don't have parental guidance at home for balancing, uh, you know, participation in gaming for so much of the day uh, where it's limited, um, then it can really get out of hand fast. Yeah. I mean, like the abuse of, of just about anything, too much of anything is not going to be good. Right. And so, the, the parents have to find that balance with their kids. I will say, you know, Fortnite has turned out to be not just, it has, has evolved from so much more than just a game, right? The reality is Fortnite is where your average 10 to 12 year old, like that's their Facebook. This is where they go and True. share stories with their friends, experiences with their friends, videos with their friends. Like it's their social network. And it's the virtual world that they occupy to do that with their friends. And so there's, I always think there's tremendous upside. And, and, you know, during the pandemic, there's been a lot of research around sort of is gaming actually good for you? And a lot of it has shown the benefits are tremendous, like quite very, very positive. Aside from sort of the edge cases of extreme addiction, mm-hmm. um, the benefits are quite positive. And one other area I'd like to explore, and I don't mean to monopolize, please, others, if you want to say something, I'll, I'll give a second round of questioning when you're done. So uh, I, I'll offer the, this back to whomever. And then I do have another question, Paul. Sounds good. Any, anybody have a question? Oh, I, I, I do, but actually, I want, I want Kevin to go again. Yeah, <laughs> Let's see where he takes this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My answer <laughs> like I said, I don't want to monopolize, but uh, uh, um, I also have a, a concern that, um, and I don't want to be negative on this. Believe me, I, I believe in gaming and esports. Give and, me the negative, because I got an answer <laughs> for it. Give, it, give uh, it to me as negative as you want to go. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just that, um, you know, I, I'm concerned that when uh, when when we think about traditional sports, that is those things that involve a little bit more physical activity, and and perhaps being out on a court or out on a field outside, whatever the case is. Um, and uh, I grew up playing three sports way back in the day, and uh, I found not only was it very good and invigorating socially and athletically and team and coordination and all that kind of stuff. But uh, there were certain positive, uh, very, very positive health benefits, uh, fitness being one of them, uh, playing outdoors, just good for the head, very good, you know, 
uh, sort of expansive. You're out on on a field somewhere and excelling or doing whatever. Uh, whereas esports, to some, and and you might say it is, uh, I'm picturing the fellow with the uh, virtual headset on. It is a rather narrowing view, although inside of that narrow view, you can do just about anything you want to. So it's an artificial expansion. But can, as you mentioned, you can participate in going to the pyramids as opposed to just reading about them or, or seeing a video about them. Um, so I, I can see the benefit there. But um, I'm concerned that some of the, again, it may relate more to overuse of gaming, but how that contributes to some negative health, health uh, outcomes, like increased stress at young age, um, uh, obesity, uh, things that kids have a tendency to do when they are confined in a space all of their own, but participating through virtual chats or whatever, but they are still in their, many of them in their basement or some other setting where it's them and this, this virtual media. So I, I'm concerned about the negative health benefits for uh, youth. It's a, it's a real concern. It's a genuine concern and it's a great point. Um, I have two answers. I have a short-term answer and I have a long-term answer. Short-term, and we're already starting to see this at the professional level. I don't know, Kevin, did you ever follow golf much? Like, have you watched golf over the last 20 or 30 years? In, in all honesty, no. I, I always tell my friends, I golf twice a year whether I need to practice or not. Okay, well, so if you look at golfers 30 years ago, they were all kind of overweight. Like, it wasn't taken, like, it was a sport, right? There was money, they were playing for money, but no one, like, there were a few that were in shape, but for the most part, they... They didn't look like athletes, right? And what they realized, like especially when Tiger came in, what what the 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 sport as as a whole realized is the fitter they were, the better they played, mm. right? And all of a sudden now all the guys are all fit, they're all strong, they're all weightlifting, they're all esports has come in a big way to the same realization. Like if you look at every big esports organization, all the pro teams, they all have nutritionists, they all have chefs. They all have trainers. They all have um, like a big part now of success in playing games at the highest level is physical fitness. And everyone, like I'm telling you across the board, every pro team is thinking about it that way. And that will trickle down to the average player, right? The average 15 year old will realize if he works out, his mind's going to be sharper. His reflexes will be faster. He will play better. And, and I think so short term, the way to solve your fear, I think, is, is like that. Long-term, traditional sports are in trouble. In yes. my mind, yes. there, there's, there's major pain on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Because fundamentally, like, why would you as a parent put your kid in football where they can get a concussion, where they can break a bone, where they can get hurt, when I can instead put them in a virtual room right, where they can still play something that feels like football, maybe get most of the physical benefit, right, but none of the risk. Mm -hmm. To me, the way we, human beings will never stop playing sports, but the way they are played 20 years from now will all happen in digital virtual worlds with all of the same or many of the same physical benefits. Like, I don't know some of the new cutting edge technology around virtual reality is not the headset. It's everything else. How do we activate the other senses? Mm -hmm. Right. And so they have now omnidirectional treadmills, essentially treadmills. You can stand on run on, you don't go anywhere, but you can run in every direction. And then that input gets translated to what you're seeing in your headset. So you could run across the field in place in a virtual world. Again, 20 years from today, technology is going to solve for this. We're going to figure out how to bring movement, mobility into okay. gaming. So I think the, the physical piece will return. Gaming at the highest level will become physical again, will become a sport in the same way. Well, that's very encouraging, Paul. I think that future is inevitable. That, 
I'm putting a lot of my own money betting on this space based on that vision of the future, because I think this is, this is, has to be where it's going. Yes, I, I agree fully. Hey, hey Paul, um, th this is uh, Philip Sukram. I'm an accounting professor in the uh, business school and the hey, school of business. And I appreciate the presentation. Definitely very eye opening. Um, there's no doubt that I always feel like I grew up in the wrong time period. Because <laughs> Me too, trust me. Now, yeah, if I grew up now, I definitely would have done the esports um, <laughs> with my extensive experience in my life with gaming. Um, but uh, one question I had, I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, when you're, when you're gaming, right, there, there's tactics involved, critical thinking, you know, teamwork. So there, yep. there's benefits that come with whichever game you're playing, depending on the video game. Um, and a question I had for you is, you know, I've seen, even, it's not just these new games like League of Legends or Fortnite, right? They have these massive tournaments for classic games that people have played in the 80s and 90s, like Street Fighter, yep. and bring out Madison Square Garden, 20,000 people arenas. So obviously the business is there and, and it's fascinating. Um, with the kind of pandemic that hit us, uh, hit the, you know, the world right now, where do you see though that type of arena experience right because when we talk about esports you don't necessarily have to be there right the technology is there to have that some, that experience um you don't need to be in the stadium but where do you see the future of those stadium events going because just like nfl nba or professional sports they're also facing the same challenges right that brings in a lot of revenue that's selling the tickets selling out the arenas and having these so so where do you where do you see that going forward Super good question. I spent so much time talking about this on the podcast. Um, I am very bearish on brick and mortar in-person events mm -hmm. for any industry, right? And the pandemic has shown just how fragile those businesses are. The reality, what happened with esports, and and here I'll use the narrow definition of esports, like two teams competing on a stage, right? Mm -hmm. What happened with esports early on is they were trying to figure out how to build out the industry, right? And so what happened is some people came in from the traditional sports industry, yeah. right? Sell out arenas. And, they, and they said, well, we've done this with sports, like we've done this with football, let's apply what we know about football to esports, right? So you get something like Overwatch League, where what they did was they sold franchises to wealthy owners, wealthy team owners, who had city-based teams playing a game and the idea was they would eventually all build stadiums in their cities. Yeah. Um, and, and, but like very much copying traditional sports, city-based teams, stadium in that city, team plays in that stadium, right? I've always been a big believer that that's absolutely the wrong way to go. That, that, that esports could be far more successful if we had not taken the trappings of traditional sports. Mm -hmm. Because... Fundamentally, the beauty of esports is it's a digital product, yeah. right? You're, the viewer, the kind of viewer experience you can create. Like if I told you, you could go watch a football game tomorrow, real football, right? But be standing behind the quarterback, right? The whole game. Wouldn't that be the most awesome, like mind-blowing experience ever? Like, and not get in the way? The, the, the ability to do that in gaming is possible. In, in physical, real sports, you can't do that. So why borrow the trappings of a physical product when you have the beauty of a digital product? So I, I hate the in-person thing. Like, and for the same reason I don't like the trappings of traditional sports, like one of those to me is arenas and filling arenas with 20,000 people. It's cool, it's a great experience. The way I think about them is they're like record players. It'll be a niche product. It'll be a, something people go and do for that feeling of nostalgia, you know, to be around other people, sweaty and high-fiving, right? But for the most part, 90%, 95% of your consumption of esports will be online, will be digital in some way. So the, the future to me, the success will be moving away from the physical, away from the brick-and-mortar stadiums um, into more innovative digital ways of watching like to me yeah. one of the areas i'm focused on as an investor is the viewer experience how do we make yeah. this truly yeah. differentiated mm -hmm. i don't know if that answers your question but 
Yeah, no, it definitely did. And 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 taking a page out of Kevin's book, I had a few follow up questions, but I'm gonna let other people <laughs> then too. Hey, uh, Paul, this is Sumin Kalia. Um, do you see an issue with the cybersecurity with all these people connected together? Do you see a haven for the hackers and crackers and malware spreaders to go in and spread information, malware to people's machines who are constantly working together? Yeah, you know, it's always a risk, but like the reality is, yeah, I've been, I've been, it doesn't maybe look like it, but I've been investing in building technology companies for two decades now. And to me, the greatest illusion um, to the public are two things, privacy and security, neither of which you have. Everyone thinks you have it, but ne trust me, what the tech companies know about you and what they can get about you uh, would blow your mind. So it's no, like, it's no more different than that kid being on Instagram all day long or on, like, like the risk is very much the same. I think the benefit of gaming is you end up with a, like my four-year-old nephew is way more tech savvy than I was at four years old as a consequence of playing games on his dad's iPad. You know what I mean? And so the more tech savvy the end user, the less likely they are to be victims of any kind of security attack or, or uh, you know, cyber attack of some kind. I think that's the one of the side benefits is you end up with a very tech savvy youth, right? Like if you want to play games on your PC, usually you have to figure out how to use a PC. You have to, you have to understand the basics. Um, and so there's a lot, there's a lot of benefit there. I don't think they're particularly vulnerable because they're gaming and they're online all the time. So you're always going to get bad people trying to do bad things. I'm not sure. I don't think gaming accelerates that in any way. Paul, um, for the students on the call, would you mind talking a little bit of, about some of the internship opportunities or sort of specific career paths that they could consider um, within the broader industry? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of like one of the interesting uh, things that happened during the pandemic and is still happening is if you look at who's hiring today, like oh, I see a lot of companies laying off people, but if you if you go to Hit Marker Jobs, which is a site dedicated only to esports jobs, um, Hit Marker like has a zillion openings. I mean, like there are companies hiring like crazy. Esports and gaming companies continue to raise venture capital, so they're always looking for people. I mean, I, I'm hiring salespeople, I'm hiring marketing people, I'm hiring content people like me personally. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of opportunity in different areas. Every, everything from hardcore software development all the way to sales and kind of everything in between. The, the reality of the industry, like I said, is it's no different than any other tech vertical in that you have these fundamental, all these components are needed and all the skills are applicable. Mary Kate, I don't know if that answered your question specifically, it, but it did. And I, I actually wasn't familiar with Hitmarker. I just shared it in the chat if anybody wants to look. But you're right; it, it's similar roles that you would find at other companies, uh, you know, with a marketing or business uh, aspect to it, but within gaming. So thank you for sharing that. Hey, Paul, I, I just had another question. How do you think? Um, moving forward, you know, next five, 15 years or so, how do you think virtual reality and augmented reality will affect um, esports? Uh, like I said, VR in my mind is the easy one. It's, it changes the world. So VR gaming because of VR will be a multi-trillion dollar industry, not billion dollar industry. Like literally every, I would say, 90% of how human beings spend their recreation time will be some form of virtual world or gaming, right? And because again, let's think about it. My, the, the analogy I always use is the Star Trek holodeck. And I don't know if you, if you Philip, watch Star Trek at all. I or know what a holodeck I saw, I, is. I saw the movie. I saw the movie. <laughs> okay, so maybe not, maybe not know what a holodeck, but a holodeck was, a, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. 
<laughs> on a on a starship in Star Trek, so on their on their spaceships, yeah. it was a room you could walk into, okay? <laughs> and you tell the computer, I want to go skiing in the Alps. Yeah. And and Simulate. snow would appear under your feet, you'd have skis on your feet, and all of a sudden you could go skiing, right? Or I want to be the the detective in a murder mystery. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're sitting in a cafe and there's you know, AI characters walking around and you can interact with them and ask questions and you're in it, you're living it, mm -hmm. right? You, you, the, all the senses are activated, smell, touch, mobility, you can move around, you can see. Technology is going to figure out how to build holodecks. I guarantee it, right? And we can argue, does it take 10 years or 20 years or 50 years, right? That, that argument is, doesn't matter. The reality is technology is going to figure out how to do that. What happens to human beings at that point when you can walk into a room and create any reality you want? Like the, the, the it's mind blowing, yeah. right? Like everything that we think we know how we do today will change. Again, travel, education, all traditional entertainment, all traditional sports, the entire adult industry, like we're talking radically changes yeah. um so vr like if you look at mankind and you look at sort of like uh you know uh, making of smelting of bronze you know railroads yeah. uh information age this holodeck future this is the next step for humankind like this is the next mm -hmm. big thing where society changes across the board massively um AR, I'm less excited about. I think short term, it has some applications. It has some applications in like, like industrial applications where a guy wearing a headset can, you know, manage inventory better and he has information and his hands are free and things like that, right? Like there are niche applications like that. I'm not convinced we're going to see people running around with, you know, like Google glasses type things because to me, you will either be in the virtual world or you'll be out of it. That halfway that AR provides is, will be interesting for the next five to 10 years. And I don't, I don't think much beyond that and much beyond niche applications. Gotcha. Thanks. Thank you. I see that Carl, uh, Dr. Lorby has his hand raised. So Carl, go ahead. Okay. I, I am outside somewhere. Whilst I do this, take part in this, so you may hear cars coming anytime and now. So, part in my, yeah, everything. Just hey, Paul. Careful, Carl. Thank you so much for this presentation. So exciting. And thank you once again for coming and teaching here in St. Peter's. I have two questions. Yes. I'll ask, it, I'll ask it two, although they are not related. The first one is simple. In the, in the next five years, how can we make St. Peter the center of esports in the US with your experience? How can we transform St. Peter to become the center? That is my first question. Mm -hmm. My second question is actually this. As you were giving the, the presentation, I went to Blackboard to visit my second life uh, <laughs> uh, portal, Blackboard yeah. Shell. So some time ago, Ed Moscal introduced us to uh, Second Life. Yes. I even used it to teach, and it was so exciting to our students. Now, we still have the, but I think Linden Lab uh, has uh, maybe not been successful. Right now, Linden Lab is building, trying to help uh, Houston Outlaws and France and San Francisco Shocks. I think you know them already, so I don't need to. I do, yeah. Very well. So, so that they can have eSports experience for the players and also their uh, fans. So do you foresee eSports and traditional sports merging in the future? But my, my, my most important question is the first one. How can we make St. Peter's the center? Thank you. Um, how can we make St. Peter's the center? Yes. I think what no no university has done successfully yet is really figure out how to merge education and the gaming itself in a way that that is holistic that makes sense that 
you know, so I think that's step one. Step two is bringing in the right corporate partners, the right industry partners to make sure that students have a path to jobs, have a path to opportunities in the industry. So, so first is how do you, how do you make sure that the, the kids are, are coming to St. Peter's to gain competitively and get an esports education and the two work together and then have a path to a career that makes sense for them because there are corporate partners interested in recruiting on campus, interested in being there, interested in kind of the specialized expertise that that St. Peter's student has. Um, so those corporate partnerships, I think, are a big part of it. Um, and, and, I, and then I think the third piece, the third pillar would be generating thought leadership out of St. Peter's. So, you know, the kinds of things I talk about, the kinds of blog posts I write, the kind, like a lot of that can, I think, can be expanded out into more interesting research, into more interesting sort of thought leadership, being on the cutting edge of where is the industry going? You know, what is, what are we thinking about? How are we thinking about the future? How are we thinking about the next couple of years? Where are there opportunities? Where are there not? Um, that kind of thought leadership, I think, would cement St. Peter's place. So um, off the cuff to me, those, are the, those would be the three things that, that St. Peter's would have to do. Um, the second question, uh, I'm not sure I, I understood it completely, is the question about... Do you foresee uh, esports merging with soccer in the next five years? Five years, no. But I, what I see is esports taking over traditional sports in 20 years. In other words, the day that gaming can recreate the virtual world of soccer, mm -hmm. soccer, how we play it today, goes away. We don't need a field out in the open somewhere. We don't need... We just need people with headsets on, on omnidirectional treadmills or standing in holodecks or whatever, playing soccer um, virtually. So I think that's the day traditional soccer goes away. But I don't think soccer goes away completely. It's just how we play it changes, if that makes sense. I am inviting you to Arsenal Soccer, soccer uh, Football Club in London in 21 years and you will come and you enjoy it with me. <laughs> uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, I, I, I'd be careful about making those 20-year bets against gaming. I really would. <laughs> it's, it's not a, I don't know. I, I don't know if you're going to be happy with the outcome. Look, I'm, I'm happy. I'm always happy to talk to skeptics, right? Yes. <laughs> because the reality, like... I've seen this skepticism before. I've been around long enough in technology that I've seen these cycles before. And there's always this initial skepticism to technology. Always, always, always. And so I think gaming's no different, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and in the end, I, I've been right more than I've been wrong. Um, and, and look, maybe my timeline's off. Maybe it's 30 years or 40 years instead of 20. <laughs> but the outcome is, in, is inevitable in my mind. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Carl, uh, if, if I may, I have a question for you, Carl. Uh, was that an open invitation for all <laughs> to join you in 21 years? Yes. Well, I hope so. Let's go. Let's, Let's go, go, man. Let's go. <laughs> we got this recorded, so. Yes. Yeah. It, it is recorded. <laughs> Any last questions? Can I ask a question? Sure, is that Nicola? Yes. Sure, go ahead. Hi, Carl. Um, my name is Nicola. I'm a student, um, graduate student at uh, St. Peter's. I just want to ask a quick question. And by the way, um, Carl, I totally support you. I believe soccer will be, will be around in 20, 21 years from now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my question is, um, are there any video games on the market that um, actually support instruction? For like elementary, middle school, or secondary schools that you know teachers could actually use in the classroom. Uh, at what level? Like at the university or level, level, or at the um, elementary, middle, or secondary? Um, there are. Uh, it's not my like. It's not my area of expertise. Like educational software. Um, I can take or educational example. games, but uh, I know there are. 
Yeah, I would add, we're, we're working on a partnership with Union City High School and the company called Helix, located in North Bergen. Helix is a physical gaming facility, um, and it's one of the largest esports gaming locations in the world. I found out that they reopened last week, and you, they have a lot of kids going there. Um, they're partnering with an ed tech company that's creating coursework, beautiful coursework. When, when Paul talk, talked about merging the gaming itself with the education, these kids are taking entrepreneurship and business courses in the context of video gaming, but instead of looking at like kind of a boring platform, they're, they're surfing around different islands and they're learning how to design logos and they're learning how to do branding. Um, in this very visually engaging world. Uh, so I could connect you, Nicola, to this company if there might be, they're getting, they're giving high school level courses, so there might be an opportunity there. And the founder of the company, whose name is escaping me, is uh, worked at Microsoft for 20 years, and then he left the company and he started his own tech startup. I mean, I've seen some really cool startups doing, like I've been pitched interesting startups doing things that straddle gaming and education like one example is um, a VR company building a game like Beat Saber I don't know if anyone knows Beat Saber but it's like you, you have lightsabers in your hand and you're you're breaking blocks in VR um, and and this this game that they were proposing uh, that they pitched to me was to teach people how to write um, Japanese characters that essentially you were like a sorcerer in a game and your wand then to cast spells, you had to draw the Japanese character correctly to cast that spell. So it was a way of making learning, you know, something that's relatively difficult, um, more fun. Uh, so I've seen a lot of that and, and we're starting to see more of that. I think you're going to see quite an explosion of at the intersection of education and gaming um, in the near future. Okay, thank you. Mary Kate, could I ask you, will you share that um, high school connection with, with everyone, uh, your, your joint venture between St. Peter's and what was the high school you mentioned? U Union City High School. Union City High School. Which, which high school did you work in? In South River. Okay. Yeah, so um, it's called Augment Ed, like I'll, I'll type it into the... But I'll, I'll share the website with you afterwards. Um, oh, thank you. I still need your email address, though. I, I couldn't find it, Kevin. Uh, all right. You just type, type it into the chat if you know how, and then I'll, I'll add it yep. to it now. Any final questions? Phil, you've used up your allotment of questions. Yeah, I'm oh. good for the day. <laughs> Got it, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, it, it, it may, there should be a K in front of that. Okay. K, K Conahan. I don't know. Well, I'll, I I'll just type. You got it with the I K? It. I got okay. it with the K. All right. Okay. It just, it shows just Conahan at Hotmail in the chat box, but it's K Conahan. All right. I got it. All right. I don't know if Carl had another question. I saw there's a hand raised. I don't know. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> He just refuses to put his hand down. <laughs> Sorry. But um, maybe, Paul, you'll be coming to my class, maybe. Happy to, anytime. Okay. Um, I fall, saw it. Online. <laughs> I have my hand up. Sorry. Uh, Carl beat me to it, but Paul, I was going to invite you to my class as well. I think that this was just an amazing seminar. Uh, yeah. And I really was not in tune to the eSports um, situation before uh, last year. St. Peter's brought it to, uh, you know, it was brought to St. Peter's and I, I really didn't understand it. Um, <laughs> now I, 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 I just think there's so much amazing potential. Um, yeah. And I, I thank you so much for the seminar. I really would love to have a conversation with you about it. Um, and about, I teach accounting and business law. So I think I think there's some crossover in our topics, um, but I would really be interested in, in having you visit my class. So thank you very much. Super happy to, Karen. Would love to. You're the same day. What, two of us. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> well, forget about me. Me too. I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm literally just across the river. I can see St. Peter's from here. <laughs>
Uh, so I want to give a huge thank you to Paul, um, A, for doing this awesome presentation today. It, it really, you're just so dynamic and your passion comes across and it helps create that passion in all of us. And I can't wait to get you in front of our students. Can I ask a question? Is, it's, is it okay to ask a question? <laughs> it's, well, it's okay by me. I don't know, as I guess so. <laughs> I guess everybody, yes, it's a very quick question. How do you see, as you know, Carl made me think about this question as he was mentioning uh, different kinds of sports and soccer in particular. So how do you see the future at the global level of the esports? Because so many countries are like developing countries or like under, you know, at the poverty level or below the level, or, you know, the, they don't have like internet, uh, full internet access like we do. We don't have the same technology as many European countries or developing countries or less developed countries. Just quick, you know, I don't Such know. a good question. No, that's such a good question. You would be amazed. One of the largest esports markets in the world by far is India. And you would not think this is not a, you know, this is not a relatively wealthy country, but everyone has a cell phone. Right? And even in very poor countries, almost everyone has a cell phone. And mobile gaming is exploding, like exploding. There's th like 300 million people in India that play PUBG Mobile, the same mobile game. Um, and so the beauty in my mind of esports and why nothing stands a chance against it is it's massively accessible, right? Like not only do you only need a cell phone, right, at the very basic level, but from a physical standpoint, like, look, I would have loved to be an NBA player. Like, I, 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 and to be, to be honest, I was, you can't tell now, but when I was much younger, I was a, an Olympic caliber swimmer. I went to the Olympics in 2000, swimming for Canada. Uh, asterisk, I never swam a race because I was an alternate. But I, if I was born 10 years later, I never would have been able to be a swimmer. Never, because at, after that point, you needed to be 6'4 plus, uh, to even stand a chance, right? And this is traditional sports. There are, there are genetic hurdles <laughs> that if you're not born tall or born like muscular or born whatever, there's nothing you can do about it. The beauty of esports is it's accessible to anyone, men, women, small, large, big, short, like it doesn't matter. <laughs> and, and, and so the, the opportunity now is not, you know, 100,000 people who are tall enough to play basketball, you're now talking about 7 billion people who could be gamers. That's what's most exciting. And so I don't think there's any country, there's any society that's too poor or too, like, again, India has 300 million players playing on mobile phones. To me, that, this is why it's exciting. Growth is going to come globally in a very, very, very big way. Technology is advanced in India. We could have this discussion in my class if you're coming. <laughs> happy to, happy to. I, I will also say, I, uh, Mary Kate, before you wrap up, I will plug because I saw there was mention of a book um, in the chat. Uh, my co host on the podcast, William Collis, uh, who I affectionately call, they call me the prophet of esports. We affectionately call him the professor because uh, he teaches esports at Becker. Um, uh, he wrote a book called The Book of Esports. Um, I wrote just the beginning, um, just the introduction. Um, fantastic book coming out in August. Highly recommend uh, everyone reading it. Sort of builds a, an academic framework around esports, gives a lot of the history. Um, really, really great book. We're working on book two, uh, which will be a more future, like a futurist look at gaming. Um, but if you want to read sort of more about it, I highly recommend the book of esports. Thank you very much. I will share it in the, in the chat. I think I got it. Well, again, um, Paul, thank you so much for this great session today. Thank you to everybody uh, who logged in and participated. Awesome questions. Paul, I'm so happy to have you as an adjunct professor at St. Peter's. Our students are going to be super excited to take classes with you. And we also appreciate your more strategic help and advice that you've offered. So look forward to speaking a little bit about those potential sponsorships and 
um, ideas that you have for us to grow our program. I agree with Karen. It's a huge opportunity for us. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mary Kate. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone. Great questions. Really good. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks.